we're going to try now to just bring together a lot of what we've heard in the course of the day. Um, I'm not from an agricultural background, um, but listening to what I've heard last night and today, it seems to me that the agenda is a little bit fragmented, um, that I need for my small brain to feel some sort of coherent picture on what it is that we are supposed to be doing and how we begin to solve this problem. Um, fortunately, I'm not in the position of having to answer that. So we're going to start off with the issue of societal behaviours. Um, and I'd like to therefore um, introduce um, my speakers to the stage. Now the first one, um, Mr Jabrandi, who member of the environment, is in the European Parliament and not allowed to leave. So he unfortunately is not able to join us this afternoon. However, Alan Buckwell, who's director for the Nutrient Recovery and Reuse Project at RISE Foundation, is with us. Please welcome him to the stage. Uh, Niels is not going to be with us. Um, he is not well. Uh, he is the uh, program says as a Swedish landowner uh, association. Um, but we do have a British landowner, uh, Tim Breitmeier, who's vice president of the CLA. He's been an active CLA member for more than a decade. He is also a farmer in Cambridgeshire. Tim, welcome to you. Thank you very much. And this is where it gets uh, really interesting. Francesco Tramontin um, sells sweets for a living. So he knows, knows all about societal behavior. He is EU Public Affairs Director from Mondelez. And uh, Ursula Hudson uh, of uh, Germany, but I, I understand that she lives in the UK at the moment. She is president of Slow Food in Germany. Thank you, Tanya. Please take a seat. So um, as, as per your program, um, apart from the first uh, participant who is not with us, unfortunately, um, I'm going to ask Alan, just to, all of them, just to speak for a couple of minutes to uh, set their stall out. So, Alan, let's start with you on the subject of societal behaviour. OK, two minutes without uh, hesitation, deviation exactly. or repetition <laughs> exactly. uh, on societal behaviour <coughs> and, and sustainable agriculture. Uh, I am going to come to the consumer part of societal behaviour, but I'm going to start because you asked for, you want focus on solutions, and unfortunately there isn't a solution, there's a complex set of solutions to the complex set of problems that have been very well laid out throughout today. And the aspect I want to develop in my remaining one minute, 50 seconds, uh, uh, it concerns nutrients and the way we're managing them. You can't grow anything crops, animals, humans, without nutrients. And two nutrients in particular turn out to be uh, uh, not only vital for all biological, all organisms, uh, but also have uh, uh, serious and deleterious uh, uh, implications for the environment are nitrogen and phosphorus. Yeah. And so we're focusing on these two nutrients. And the question is, how can we manage them better? Because what we've discovered in recent years through the tremendous research that's been done is that the explosion in the use of nutrients in order to feed the expanded world population who are living longer, changing their diets, uh, and, and have much more money to spend on everything, including food, uh, the expansion in nutrient use uh, that has gone with that turns out to be very leaky and wasteful. And a very high proportion, uh, like more than 80% of nutrients applied into the system uh, are not taken up by humans, but are dissipated through uh, into the water or into the atmosphere, mostly with harmful effects. Harmful effects for the climate, harmful effects in air pollution for human health, uh, nitrogen oxides and particulates, uh, and, and climate change. Uh, it, it has Im negative impacts on biodiversity, uh, both on land, in, in waters, and in the marine environment. So this is a serious global problem. What can we do about it? What are the actions? We can recover more of, of these, uh, these leakages and these wastes, or we can attempt to, and reuse them. Uh, in other words, we move from a linear system uh, where, where material is dumped and finds its way into the environment uh, uh, harmfully uh, into a more circular system. And it turns out, when you look at it, there's considerable scope to do it. Funnily enough, it's not new. We're already, uh, half of the nutrients in crop production in Europe come from manures. That's, a, that's the age old, as old as agriculture itself, 
uh, is the integrated crop and livestock systems uh, where the animal waste fertilise the crops. The problem is we do it very ineffectively. Uh, uh, and so we've got th th there's, there's, sp there's both scope to improve the, the collection and the reuse of nutrients uh, and tremendous benefits. Uh, uh, it also, incidentally, uh, uh, answers the problem of finite uh, uh, resources, that people worry about the fact that, that we depend on phosphorus, which is a mined mineral only found in five countries, uh, and there's a security issue about that. Well, recovering and reusing European nutrients is a way of diversifying our source and giving greater resilience to agriculture. Now, what's this got to do with consumer attitudes and consumer behaviour? And the answer is uh, that, that there is a reluctance about having your food produced from one of the main uh, uh, sources of recovery, human waste, sewage. Uh, and now, th the fears are partly absolutely legitimate. Uh, nobody wants to have heavy metals, pathogens, pharmaceuticals uh, uh, in their food products. And so the challenge is, and this is a challenge for information, discussion, debate, negotiation about the processes, the safety limits, and the acceptable levels, uh, and how these recovered nutrients can be used. Uh, and, and what we're tending to find is, is that some participants in the food chain are making decisions for consumers. We think that, that we can engage consumers better uh, 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 directly. Right, okay, let's come back to that. So the first issue is one about how we fertilize crops, quite simply, and uh, what is an acceptable way to do it, and what is an effective from an environmental uh, uh, way of, of doing it. Let's now turn to Tim. As I've mentioned, he is a farmer, and he no doubt has a view on what Alan has said, but I'm interested to hear your thoughts on societal behavior. Um, I just wanted to... Um uh, set the scene, and I feel this is actually a, uh, this is actually one of education, uh, and I think it's education of our farming community to a degree. Uh, we're taking them on a journey. It's a journey they've already started, uh, but I think we have to move away from uh, our mindset of an agricultural policy that was there to um, uh, have cheap food and lots of it, uh, and we have to take them on a land you, on a journey that ends up with better use of land, so we produce that sustainable production of food whilst at the same time nurturing uh, the balance of resources that we in fact have to look after as landowners. And I do see this as a long intergenerational game that the landowners and the farmers who actually produce the food, they are the people who, uh, who actually can produce the solutions. Okay. Um, so that's the first bit. Secondly, the second bit of education uh, which comes on more to the topic we're on at the moment, is, I think, education of the supermarket and the processing chain. We must, we must eat the food that the farmers produce. And we've already heard one of my colleagues earlier saying uh, that 40% of carrots actually don't reach the supermarket. We must try and make sure that a far, far higher percentage of the produce grown actually is, arrives on the dinner table. And once it's arrived on the dinner table and in the fridge, we need to make sure that we actually use it and that we don't actually then throw away half the stuff that's been bought out of the supermarket. And that leads us on to the third one, uh, which is probably a little bit out of my comfort zone as a farmer, uh, but that of actually trying to educate the consumer. Um, uh, clearly, the dietary concerns of the 7 to 1 conversion ratio of livestock uh, from grains it is unsustainable going forward, both from a greenhouse gas emissions policy and also a, a, a dietary problem of obesity, whilst the rest of the world actually goes hungry. And so there, there's a clear uh, education problem there as well. And uh, I'll come back to what I think some of the solutions that farmers can, uh, can bring to the table um, in that production pattern going forward. Jolly good. Francesco, as I, I mentioned, um, he runs part of a company uh, or, or uh, represents part of a company that, you know, you sell sweets and biscuits and stuff. So you know a lot about the way the consumer mind operates. So tell us what you're thinking. Yeah, thank you, Tanya. And a lot of what heard today is inspiring and humbling coming from um, part of kind of the, cor the corporate part of the stakeholders here in the room. Now, though, the reality of what my business is about, I mean, as you said, it's a fairly large confectionery company. We produce chocolate, biscuits. Uh, it's a company where whenever I even start saying at home I may change job, my daughters tell me, what the hell you, would you want to do that? You work for a chocolate company. Uh, but kind of that's the core of what we are about, because our business is 
first of all, is relying on a steady and important supply of quality raw material to run our business, such as cocoa and wheat. But then the core of our business is actually selling our products to consumers that trust our brands and have been trusting them for generations. This is the particular intersection that makes companies like mine unique in driving progress in sustainability and specifically sustainable agriculture. Because we do and we have seen a shift in the importance consumer plays on well-being in general. They like products that make them feel good. Chocolate clearly is one. They like products today that are healthier because they are more and more conscious about um, health effect on, on, uh, of, of what they eat. And they are, because of where the world is going, they are increasingly more conscious about where and how products are sourced. So this trend gives us, as brand owners, an opportunity to leverage and, and create supply chain transformation. Sustainable agriculture is for us, um, exactly at this intersection, a big opportunity to again source our raw materials and basically deliver um, that trust element that our consumers are looking for. Now, in all this, focus is key. Again, we are business, we are focused on a number of products on a number of raw materials, we can influence only so much if we can focus on the right thing. And I'll stop here and let you. Excellent. Uh, we'll come back to that because I think you have a, a very good insight there. Uh, Ursula, if we can come to you uh, on the subject of uh, slow food, what is your insight into societal behavior and you know, how we can influence it? Um, a couple of aspects. Um, Slow food thinks the, um, the dominant output uh, productivist oriented food farming system is basically broken. We heard a lot about it today. I refer back to Achim Steiner in the morning. He painted a picture, the picture actually very clearly for that kind of farming. Farming is not farming. We do not <coughs> forget that there are quite a number of millions of farmers that do not contribute to that negative impact. Um, from a slow food point of view, I want to stress biodiversity loss and also stress that biodiversity is not only meant uh, in terms of flowers and panda bears, uh, it's basically agrobiodiversity in case um, this is, has been forgotten. Then soil fertility, of course the climate, the hunger, the hunger and the obesity, but also the rift, we have, haven't heard a lot about that today, the rift between the consumers and the producers, which is a great shame and we need to bring this together in order to achieve what we need to achieve. Um, Slow Food says that change can be achieved by uh, and instigated by each of us uh, striving basically for good, clean and fair food, for supporting uh, the relocation of food systems, the diversification of food systems, bringing them nearer, uh, getting interested and ad adding value again to food in the sense that food is our stuff for life and not only for our health. Um, but this is one way, but then we have the political level, and on the political level, particularly within the light of the SDGs, as we have been discussing today, um, Slow Food uh, thinks that it is high time to um, assess the fitness of the current agricultural policies of Europe. Um, we heard today that Europe should be leading into, into um, this, this future of working together um, on the uh, sustainable development. Assessment. We need a reality check and within the context of the European Commission's uh, regula regulatory fitness and, and performance program, the refit program, many policies have undergone um, this refit. It is time to um, do the reality check on, reality check on the cap. Um, Commissioner Phil Hogan has painted a glorious picture today of uh, the EU policies fit for the future. Uh, why do we hear on ongoing milk crisis? Why do we have a program milk for refugees? Why is Hogan looking for more markets? Uh, we have a market orientation on the one hand, which turns farmers into producers uh, of mass production or commodities for a world market, becoming volatile, uh, dependent on volatile prices. Um, that doesn't look too good. We have lost one in four farms between 2003 and 2013 in Europe. Um, so it's high time with that. <coughs> and um, on the reality check, it's also a question of to what degree can the consumers actually really source food from a sustainable food system um, if that leads to all the problems Achim Steiner has painted today, so this production system. And with a look in the room today and also on this stage as the previous one, I would say also the reality check requires that we 
um, look very carefully at the role of women in farming. Women are the backbone um, in farming worldwide. We do not see that many women here, I must say. Anyway, um, in the light of all of this, um, Slow Food Greenpeace, uh, the EEB, and many other Brussels-based um, NGOs have um, drafted a, written a letter uh, to the president of the commission, President uh, Juncker, in order to uh, put the cap under the refit program. This has been signed now by about 100 signatories within a very few days. Um, and we hope this um, might bring us a little bit forward. Um, the slow food solution, to go back to the slow food solution, and we have been saying this in, within the Brussels context now for about a year, <coughs> would be we have to radically change our thinking and our approach must be, and it has been mentioned from time to time during the day and yesterday evening as well, we, we, we probably have to do away with the, with the departmentalized way of working around everything that relates to food and our way of consumption. So we need a EU common sustainable food policy, probably more than a reform of the existing policies. Thank you for the beginning. Okay. So uh, my uh, experience as a consumer is that if you go into a supermarket, there is some sort of nod to the problem that you're describing. Sometimes there is, uh, you know, a little fair trade corner organic corner, but it is not endemic in the way that the supermarkets operate. Really, they try to produce, you know, arrays of perfect carrots, and this is the big supermarkets I'm talking about, or fruit or whatever it is, there's lots of packaging, and the consumer is very much able to fall back on the perfect produce. And I wondered, Tim, if there is a frustration there that supermarkets... Um, are not really prepared to do battle with their consumers now. I know that some, so one in particular is, is now prepared to sell uh, misshapen vegetables and so on, but really it's almost like a niche market. It is not something as a consumer that we accept that food is not perfect. And you were telling me a very interesting story about one particular company, Warburton's. Um, Tanya, down in the audience somewhere is one of my tutors. And uh, I remember the big battle when, um, uh, uh, when I went through agricultural <coughs> college was, was the consumer king or was the supermarket king? And um, actually, when you look at the supermarket, whose one aim is to actually satisfy shareholders, um, if they think that uh, the most popular product is the straight orange carrot that is perfectly sized and can be taken out of a plastic bag, then that's what they will sell because that's what will make them the most profit. That does not mean to say that that is the most sustainable solution. And, no, but uh, we know, is it not the case that after, uh, in the last 10 years, that the consumer has become much more aware of provenance, for example. They have become much more aware of, I don't know, banana farmers and so on. We have begun to understand this, and in society, we have become more prepared to try to influence people's behaviour. It would be unthinkable 20 years ago that you would say to people that they couldn't smoke in a public place. It was considered their right to do so. Now we do consider it our right to try to educate the consumer in order to encourage uh, them to make a different choice. Uh, can I pick up here? Um, <clears throat> who leads who in all this? Uh, uh, the, the consumers are perfectly capable of making their own decisions about w what and where to buy, and, and I would have thought that there's more choice now in uh, food outlets and, and uh, styles and kinds of food with different degrees of narrative attached to them than there ever has been. Um, as, as Tim says, the, the supermarkets uh, are obviously nervous about being the ones who are uh, giving any hint of instructing or telling consumers what they can, should take. Uh, and so if their experience is that, that uh, their fruit bins are uh, at the bottom of the fruit bins every evening uh, are the, 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 the slightly misshapen, the slightly marked, the slightly discolored apples, then what do we expect they're going to do with that? I mean, one, one thing right. is, for goodness sake, recover it and recycle it yes. uh, uh, or feed it to animals or whatever, at least, at least do that. Uh, but, but, you know, to what extent are we prepared to... to uh, how do we stimulate consumers to take more interest in some of these issues 
Uh, let me give you another example. Organic food has, has, has given, uh, has, is a label which has been established after a lot of effort, uh, and it's kind of universally accepted as a, as a mark of, 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 of higher care, environmental care for the, for the land that's associated with it. And now, what's the penetration of organic food in Europe? Uh, is it 5% yet? Uh, and this is after decades of, uh, I mean, people are voting with their feet there, that, that there is a, right. a market for well, it. Well, there is a cost implication, and, and we'll come back to that. Francesco, I can yeah, see that you're just burning. A, yeah, exactly. Uh, just else. a little bit of insight. I'm not a marketeer, but I'm surrounded by them. Uh, <laughs> so I'm used to, <laughs> to deal with them. So it's two thoughts. Uh, retailer, supermarket, versus brand manufacturer. We tend to bundle all of them together just because we feel we are the consumer facing part of the stakeholders. It is very different. Um, I'm generalizing, but uh, a supermarket owner, a retailer, for them what they sell is the shopping experience. They want to tell their consumers, you come into my shops, everything is taken care of. No negatives. So there, there's no interest in communicating other than reassuring the shopping experience. So the label is a way of telling you, I've taken care of that. The brand owner has a totally different dynamic, and not, it's not that one is good, one is bad, but that's how marketing works. The, o, the brand owner would want to engage the customer on a specific story that it's attached to the brand. So the brand owner is similar to what Slow Food does. Is so, sorry, just clarify what you mean by that. So you, you, ha you might have a story attached to a chocolate bar, for example. Exactly. Where That's become quite a fashion where, thing. Where the but they're more expensive, those ones, aren't they? Exactly. Yeah, There's the more expensive. story comes at a price. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the reality is that these are two different ways to engage in consumer. One is a consumer that goes and picks a brand. The other is a consumer that goes and picks a shopping experience, whatever the shopping What I'm talking experience. about is I wonder how it is possible not just to have this, as you mm. rightly point out, with organic food, as a niche experience, yeah, to make it a more general understanding yeah, that Tanya, when we engage with food... Last, last point. So, again, if you take organic, if you take fair trade certified, if you take slow food, you have a lot of various niches all together. They all look fairly small. Now, if you bundle them up together, and I use the word consumer shift to well-being, which is the broad sense, when you go and shop, you don't think too much about it. You feel it. You feel the goodness, that it's in, it's in a choice, which may be good for you, that's the health element, and may be something more linked to value, like it is the slow food movement, for example. Mm -hmm. Those are, uh, this, this is a movement that goes much beyond a niche, and it's a movement that if leveraged, in a unique, more unique and seamless direction can actually create something good. So we as marketeers, we see it as more of a niche. I mean, today, if you bundled up healthier choices, if you bundled up so-called lifestyle choices that's your organic, sustainably sourced, and you put together something which may be portion controlled, again, something that plays into health, you look at part of our portfolios that go beyond 30% of what we offer today. <coughs> but that's not visible as it should be. Ursula. I would, um, the slow food experience is that people who engage and are interested in their food know really where their food comes, where the story isn't such the selling point. So really know where the food comes from. They do waste much less. If you know, um, if you are close to a farmer and if you take interest in the farm, farming labor um, and how your food is produced, you're not going to waste any of that because you know how much work it was. And for slow food also, it's always important to highlight the waste isn't at the end. The waste in the current dominant farming system begins before it's even planted because it has to be planned for excess. It has to be planned, planned for weather. You know that. Um, the carrots have to be delivered to the supermarket or the, to the retailer or whoever is going to take it, whatever the weather pattern is going to be. So we have, we have waste basically planned into the system at the very beginning. And I find it really difficult to take that it is always the poor consumer at the end who has to fix it. 
Uh, the consumers can't fix it like that in that system. Um, we need to produce, we have heard it today, much more wisely, consume much more wisely, and also dare to think that we probably, in our system, in our endless supermarket shelves, we have too much food in there, which is not really necessary. Um, people who do not waste food in that way and buy the carrots, which are not with one stroke peeled, as this uh, Walmart demands, um, they don't buy necessarily all their food in supermarkets, they buy in other systems. And this is where I started my point saying, we can instigate change to a better system, to a fairer system, to a more sustainable system, if we work with the farmers, if we become co-producers, as we call them, not only consumers, we don't just uh, uh, t do away with it, and engage together and do this together. Okay, um, Tim. Just um, following on from this one, the business of um, the perfect product syndrome, as I call it, mm -hmm. um, uh, it's very, very, not only is it a terrible waste of food that has been produced by the farmer, it's also a terrible waste of natural resources. Mm -hmm. To get that perfect product will mean that the carrot has to have 30 millimeters per hectare more water so that you can grow that perfect product so that it is acceptable for the consumer. And so we come back to the education. They have to understand that what they are being pushed into is an incredibly expensive um, use of our natural resources to get to the final product. And another example is, um, is bread. You can produce very good bread with a nitrogen protein content of 12.5%. And a very good company in the UK called Warburton's does it. But most of the millers ask for 13%. That is pounds and pounds per hectare of extra fertilizer used on a field just to satisfy the perfect solution. So let me ask you this. We've identified really comprehensively, I think, that it causes a problem, this desire for too much food and, and for too perfect food. But what I'm trying to get to here is who can influence the consumer such that when they walk into a supermarket, they are ready to accept something different and then this changes the, the, the production process? Because we're not talking about production at the moment, we're talking about societal behavior. I'll offer you some suggestions. We can start with education and schools and school meals, and there's a lot of discussion about that, and there's been some progress in that, in, in sense helping children to understand how food is produced and what healthy diets look like. So, so of course, we start there. But if, to the extent, I mean, we've, what we've heard today is that there are serious, both public health, diabetes, uh, uh, heart disease, and so on, uh, uh, issues ar around the consumption, the overconsumption of sugars uh, uh, in, in many countries, developed and developing, uh, and there's serious environmental issues connected with, with the extent of livestock consumption. Now, communicating those messages is not a straightforward thing. Uh, government clearly, because the messages that, that by and large, uh, uh, they don't seem to be well received. There's always a group who's going to be uh, concerned about how that message sounds to their business or their life. Uh, and uh, I mean, the fact that, that, that consumers are confused by health messages, of course there's a government guidance issue, and governments do try to provide this guidance. Uh, the question is uh, how to get beyond the information, the exhortation routes, uh, and, and very few governments on very few products have gone further in the way of taxation or stronger measures. Now, but, but, but this is the choice that we need, and in a sense, we need a more... Uh, I guess it's a, rep a constant repetition of these debates in audiences like this uh, to, 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 for, for consumers to hear why we need to be talking about them and then, in a sense, the industry to learn, well, how on earth are we going to uh, uh, manipulate change? But there is, uh, recently there was um, a, a government initiative uh, in the UK in, in the last few weeks, in fact, wasn't there, to talk to people about how they should um, exercise and so on. And there was a little test that you could do. I don't know if you did it. I didn't. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, there was some reluctance. You know, some people said, well, I don't need to be told how to eat and so on and so exactly. forth. And was this money well spent? And there was a big debate. So there is still a little bit of reluctance there uh, and there's still a, a, a lack of desire to learn. And the other thing I would say to you is that um, it's all very well if you can afford to um, pay extra <coughs> in the cases where that might be the solution. Uh, many people would say they can't afford to. 
Absolutely. Any if thoughts on that, Ursula? Yes, but I mean, we have had this discussion about the price today. And we, if, we, if we look at the sustainable development goals, we need to face the uncomfortable uh, true cost discussion. Um, we have had it today perfectly worded. I cannot word it better. <coughs> Either we prolong the problem of non-sustainable food production um, and keep prices down, or we address the price problem. And we have to address the price problem. We have a, we have a, a, a dangerous uh, close nexus between very cheap calories and very cheap food, too many cheap calories, and we have also um, the problem of cheap labour and cheap food prices. And this is social stability and social sustainability, which um, comes in far too little, actually, as well as the cultural one. This is not only about economy and ecology. Tim. Um, can I follow on from what Ursula said? We, we must remind ourselves that the average farm income in Europe is 16,500 euros. Yeah. And uh, we are asking our farmers to uh, go to a much more complex system, uh, so they produce the food supplies we want, but sustainably. And that comes at a price. The greenest, most sustainable farmers in Europe are the ones who farm profitably in the black. And so the only way they're going to achieve that profitability is, first of all, by having greater productivity, and they, uh, and they do need to get there, and technology will get them to a degree. However, equally, they need to be pay paid a fair price for the food they are sustainably producing for the planet. And how can they ensure that they are paid a fair price? Because, as we know, it's supermarkets who are holding the whip hand here, right? Well, uh, uh, that, that, that's a question that has rolled around for years and years, and there's the debate with um, supermarkets, the power of the supermarket versus, versus the farmer on the ground. Uh, we have grocery adjudicators in the UK who try and solve the problem. That is not an easy one to solve. Uh, but that is the nub and the root of the problem. Food is too cheap, and it's going to be certainly too cheap if you want it produced sustainably. Francesco. Yeah, I mean, all I want to add, and I'm consciously being a bit provocative in this, is that don't consider marketing as a bad world in this space. And I, know, I don't mean marketing in the corporate sense, big brand, corporate marketing its own brand. I mean, it's the way your organization, for example, do, do it. Because it's, at the end, it's about engaging the consumers. In certain cases, that engaging the consumers may bring those price premium you're talking about. Again, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution, but it's part of the equation. The first point, um, yeah, and I would say to me that's an important point because... So what are your, um, your customers, and clearly you do market research as to what sort of things people want to buy. What are the people who buy your products, so they're milk or chocolate bars and biscuits? Well, and we, have, we go from, again, let's take the example of chocolate. We go from <laughs> the, I'll use the UK example, we go from green and black green and black, chocolate very good, that yeah. does appeal to the super conscious consumer. It's all fair trade, organically produced, all comes from almost one origin, to all type of middle option, to kind of mainstream brand like Milka, for which we offer a baseline of our sustainably sourced program, so we do provide certain guarantees. So what does that tell you? Does that tell you that people just want a very wide choice and price range? Does it tell you that they want less sugar? What, what, where are the consistent? As I was saying Sorry. before, the consumer is generally looking for that broader well-being element of which sustainably sourced is one element. Now, there's the whole world of the so-called negatives, which we should strive to eliminate out of our supply chain. And what are they? Those systemic issues, deforestation, climate change impacts, all type of social issues. These are things we need to address nevertheless. But if your we company were to say overnight, yeah. we are only going to sell products which are sustainably sourced, right? So let's just use that expression, whatever it might mean. What would happen? Well, the problem would the is. Would the price go up? The problem, I'm sorry. It's, yeah, there's a cost, there's an investment on our supply, <coughs> supply chain that we need to put in, that we do not necessarily, actually in most cases, we don't and cannot pass to our consumers. So the overall investment is not passed on our consumer. My, uh, take the example of Coco. My, my company has committed 400 million in the next 10 years. These are not dollars that are 
passed on to the consumers necessarily. It can happen when there's a partic particular marketing or particular program that a consumer is looking for. Now, the word sustainably sourced is misleading in itself because sustainability is a journey, not a destination. I think the sustainably sourced tag has created a lot of confusion because I sell you something that is sustainably sourced, it's free of every sin, and we know it's just not controllable and it's impossible. But striving for positive impact is what we should be doing and should demonstrate. Tim, are the labels offered for foods where a farmer has made, uh, tried to make food organic or sustainably sourced, are the labels associated with that enough to compensate? Do you see what I'm saying? Is, is, is the message to the consumer and the response from the consumer sufficient to compensate for the extra cost and the investment? Um, I mean, we have a we have a, a scheme which we call the Red Tractor Scheme, and it's, rec it's a um, renowned label uh, that British consumers do recognize, um, uh, and, but it doesn't produce any extra money. Uh, that's the key thing about it. Uh, now, there are, uh, there are schemes um, which, um, which can attract a premium, but the majority of the schemes that we have in the UK, which will then have a label attached to it, are effectively um, a requirement of the supermarket to actually sell that farmer's produce. And I think that's almost, there, there, there in lies the problem, it's almost the wrong way round. Uh, they, are, they are having to produce that sustainability and have a label attached to it, but they're not actually getting paid anything more for it. Mm. Um, uh, and then the whole business of labels of sell-by is another, another yeah, game we're gonna altogether. Get to, we're going to get on to that. Alan. <laughs> I think what we're discovering here is what a <laughs> truly difficult area this is. We've only talked about food going through retail purchase and not food service, and food service is about half of the flow of food nowadays, and, and who, when they're in the canteen and they're buying their sandwich, ask where the sourcing of the lettuce or the tomato was. Uh, they, by and large, don't. Uh, um, th I mean, w we've heard this phrase, cheap food, thrown out. Well, where in, Euro where in the world is food more dear than it is in Europe? Well, I'll tell you two or three countries, uh, uh, Norway, uh, Switzerland. More dear, Jap meaning more expensive. More expensive, uh, uh, Japan. Uh, Europe is amongst the highest food price zones in the world because we have, high, we have tariffs against food imports. Uh, we protect our farmers. Now, so, so we start from a high price regime uh, and you're all arguing for higher prices. Now, uh, it's a fairly brave government that says that, 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 that uh, we're going to uh, uh, take actions that's going to raise the prices of food. It's a rather regressive mood, as Tim Benton said this morning, because it were poorer people and larger families spend a bigger proportion of their incomes on food. Uh, and so it's regressive in that sense. So therefore, we've got to adjust the benefit system and we've got to adjust the living wage system to accommodate this. These are not, uh, you know... It's not popular policy. Well, they're neither popular nor, nor cheap nor, nor easy. Uh, so, so, so that, that, you know, we're back to information, education, exhortation and role models. Uh, and, and in a sense, trying to, to, trying to get some excitement by getting people to focus on the healthiness of their diet or the unhealthiness of certain diets or combinations of diet and exercise and so on. Uh, and, but I still keep coming back to the one that we, we, we just don't seem to be, we, we're very reluctant to engage in is, how are we going to deal with this livestock problem? You've heard about five times today that, 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 uh, that globally and in Europe, uh, that, 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 that the livestock sector is, is very leaky. Uh, it's just an intrinsic part of it. And funny enough, cattle uh, within that are, are amongst the worst offenders. Uh, now, are we going, is, is this something that we're just going to shrug and look the other way? Uh, but at some point, we've got we've to stare at this problem and decide uh, the really seriously difficult question of what is the optimal balance of livestock and crops in, in European and world agriculture? It's certainly not zero because we need the... <coughs> the, the, the but again, it comes back to the question, how do you engage the consumer? with difficulty, but, but by talking about it. Now, that's what we're trying to do. I think we, um, Tanya, I think we talked about it very briefly um, when we were running through, through affairs last night, and that is you have to almost come at the consumer from a different angle, in so much as you probably have to encourage well-being, mm -hmm. um, and well-being uh, well leads on into having a healthy diet. The consumer doesn't really want to be told you've got an unhealthy diet, you're eating too much fat. Uh, you're eating too much carbohydrate. Uh, and I think um, 
there has to be a, a strong message um, uh, and nationally, supranationally, super um, uh, that uh, we have to have greater well-being and w greater well-being um, has diet at the centre of it. But Tim, isn't the same for a, for a farmer? I mean, if you go to a farmer and say, oh, you shouldn't do this, this, this and that because it's bad for the environment, you, yeah, they may, you may do Absolutely, it, but then you get yeah. a reaction. You need to find something engaging which has a future. As consumer, that's what we react to, is the positive story where I want to get to, or the positive shopping experience, or the positive eating experience. I'm, I'm just saying that I don't think telling a consumer you've got to have a better diet is going to work. God. <laughs> no, and I think that maybe part of the difficulty is that, you know, consumers as a group are not particularly cohesive. Maybe farmers as a group in a way are not because they are, it's a quite fragmented in many cases and so on. If you're talking to a number of very big companies, then you can, there's something that you can do to turn the screw on them. But it's very difficult if, if everybody feels the hit themselves and they're saying, but if I do something, really does it make a difference? You know, that's, that's very difficult to engage, uh, particularly engage consumers on that front. I want to ask if anybody out there uh, at this stage has questions. I'm sure you do because you're quite vocal. Yes, please, there's a gentleman at the front. Please, could we get a microphone to you? I'd be very grateful if you would say what your name is and where you're from and to whom your question is directed. And if you turn the microphone on, that'd be good too. Might be just not faded <coughs> up yet. Thank you. Um, my name is Fernando Sampaio. I'm from the Brazilian Roundtable on Sustainable Beef. Sustainable beef in Brazil? Yes. Right. Well, my question is about private standards. We have seen a proliferation of private standards, and this is becoming an issue, including in the WTO, because they are mostly uh, harmful Sorry, to trade. Sorry, I didn't hear trade. what you said there. Private you standards. Proliferation of what standards? Private, private standards. Private standards, OK. Yes. Um, so my question is, so on one hand, uh, on the commodity market, this is uh, uh, probably will make these sustainable commodities more expensive and unaffordable to especially the population in developing countries. And on the other hand, uh, the problem I see is that we are creating system to exclude a lot of farmers that are not able to meet these standards. So you see that as the good way to go uh, in opposition to dissemination of good practices in farming, for example. So your concern is standards that farmers are required to meet? Yes. Okay. D who would like to take that question? You know, I, do you, do you? Yeah, yes. I, mean, I, I can take an example. I mean, to me, the point is that standards need to be seen as important tools, and again, I'm saying important because it's not in a der derogatory way, but they are not the solution themselves. To your point, standards need, farmers need to be helped to meet the standards. And it's not the standard itself which will, which will sort it out. Now we see it on cocoa, where like 70% of our cocoa comes from two African countries. Most of the farmers on our supply chain are not able to meet the standards unless they are helped, which I think it's your point. Does that answer your question? Yes, please. If we could get a microphone here, that would be great. Anybody wave at me quickly now if you have a question so we can get a microphone. There's a lady up there and we could get a microphone to you as well. Yes, please. And there are some down the front. So if you pass your microphone to this lady okay. afterwards, that would be great. Yes, please. Where are you Thank from? You. Thank you. I'm Winfried Blum from the University of Natural Resources and Life Sciences in Vienna, Austria. I gained the impression here in this discussion that there's a general belief that sustainable agricultural production is more expensive yep. than non-sustainable. I doubt enormously yes, exactly. about that. That's not true. Thank you. We wanted to bestow this evening in the mm -hmm. uh, dinner, during the dinner ceremony, uh, the Land and Soil uh, Management Award to a group of farmers from southern Portugal um, <coughs> and, uh, who were able, within about 20, 25 years, to change their system in such a way, without a lot of investment, by stopping erosion, I, I could give you many examples now, but it's, there's no time for that, raising, increasing soil organic matter in soil, and so forth and so on, and ha have now less nutrient leaching, 
they can use much more uh, irrigation water on larger mm -hmm. surfaces, yeah. is, is and so forth and so on. That, the that yield, means yeah. the point which I would like to make is we have to see the time scale of changes. Soils and land is a very conservative system, and it's reacting very, very slowly. If you go from no uh, till to no till, you are losing in some years until you have a new equilibrium. It takes four, five, or even more years, depending on the local situation. But it's possible. So we cannot say we do that tomorrow. It's not possible in agriculture. And we have to take this in consideration. But the, 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 the opinion that uh, sustainable agricultural production is more uh, expensive, expensive. You, you in the sense of uh, keeping groundwater clean and biodiversity yeah. is not true, in my opinion. Right, but, but the Skype time scale you have to consider. Mm. Thank you. Okay, Tim, let me ask you why, why you connect more sustainable farming with more expensive farming. Are you talking about yield or how you grow the crop? No, I think, um, uh, and I totally accept the fact that once uh, soil is the key to everything, we must make our soil better, and that's part of the sustainable, sustainable farming model. Uh, I think it's in addition to um, uh, getting to that point, and as you say, it won't, we won't get there straight away, it is the fact that we are providing a number of services at the same time to society, like keeping the water clean, um, like making sure that we have um, areas that are sufficient for pollinators to live in, uh, making sure that we keep the biodiversity in the countryside. All of those are services that I think are part of that sustainable model. Um, and d those bits of it do not necessarily mean that you can actually produce a crop or actually get a productive return from those particular areas. And so that has to be paid for somehow. Um, now, it may be that public policy instruments can pay for that, and we can carry on in the center of the field with very sustainable, very productive farming over a period of time. Uh, but it will take time to get there, and I think farmers will need support. Alan. Yes, of course, there are plenty of examples out there of farmers who are paying fantastic attention and knowledge to their soil management, to their biodiversity management on their farms, and they would therefore reasonably be called more sustainable. And, 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 it doesn't and they can be more uh, economically efficient too. There's a huge variation in, in uh, economic performance amongst farmers, and I'm quite sure, but we never <coughs> measure it, there's a lot of variation in environmental management amongst farmers too. But the problem is that, that what you're observing there is self-motivated behavior. People who are sufficiently aware and care that of course they will do those things and they don't need further reward to do it. Uh, the problem is that, that manifestly, because environmental performance standards are not being met across European agriculture, I mean that's, that's simply a, a fact, uh, that, 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 that uh, without some form of inducement, uh, we're not getting the, 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 the behavior we want. And therefore, farmers are asking, uh, that, that, as Tim just did, we've got to be uh, supported or rewarded for it. And this is what Commissioner Hogan spent this morning telling us, that 30% that, that of cap payments are to, to, to compensate farmers for farming more sustainably. Uh, the requirements are fairly feeble, but, but at least the, that's the theory of what's going on. So, so, I mean, I think there's a general acceptance that it can be done at, 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 at little or no additional cost, but by and large, it's not being done. Uh, and, and in order to get it done, uh, we're prepared to offer inducements. Yes, please. Question, uh, there was a question at the back. <coughs> yes, my name is uh, Noah Simon. I'm a veterinarian and I work with bees. So actually, working from the field, I can say that we are, we really need a much more sustainable uh, agriculture because we observe big problems uh, in areas of, with bees, in areas with, um, with intensive agriculture. So actually, this is what I do in my work, but as I am a, um, um, a consumer as well. Um, I also engage personally into responsible uh, consumption, so participating with a lot of debate uh, with the local producers. And actually, I just wanted to to agree with what uh, was said before. Like uh, in our discussions with the local farmers, uh, it seems that the ones that are taking care of their uh, of their production system, uh, they they expend less, so actually they are better off. Um, so I think uh, 
pro uh, producing sustainably, it is economically interesting. Okay, good. I think, uh, Ursula, a quick comment, if you wouldn't um, Oh, yeah. There are, there are wonderful examples of, of exactly what you're describing. There, for example, the, the city of Stockholm, I think, um, um, sources now for all their public food areas. So from, from nurseries to old people's homes, 70% um, organic at the same price. Um, we always think it can't be done. I'm thinking now, I, I, was, I was following from your thread of um, responsible consumption organically. And of course, there is not everyday meat, how we solve the, 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 the livestock problem. Everyday meat on the menu. Everything changes if you do that. Uh, and everything changes actually to <coughs> a more interesting, a new, uh, a different way. The menus are so utterly exciting, you don't want to eat anywhere else in the world. You don't want to go back to your canteens with uh, every day a slab of meat on, yeah? Because it's fantastic. So we need to dare to do the different thing and say, yes, we can do it. For so many, There are thousands of... of, of, of plates of food every day served for the very same price as before. It can be done. The price issue is a relative one, depending on how you approach it. Tim, briefly. No, I'm you weren't going to say. Jolly good. And there was a lady here who had a question. Yes, please. Jeffrey Sachs said that the, today that nothing is achievable without education. And I think here we need to be looking at education if we are hoping to change behaviour. We need to be looking to our present generation of school children. But above all, we need to be focusing on the teachers' training colleges and the teachers. Unless we teach the teachers, we have no hope. And unless children and their teachers know how to cook and know where their food comes from, we will achieve nothing. Mm -hmm. I, I represent the Suffolk Agricultural Association, where we have 5,000 school children on the showground in a couple of weeks' time. A couple of years ago, I talked to one of the teachers who said she'd really enjoyed the potato <laughs> exhibit because she'd always thought potatoes grew on bushes. Now, unless we do something about this, um, there is not. no hope. Unless, <coughs> unless the teachers actually understand. And unless you actually know how to cook, you cannot actually eat either healthily or economically. Right, so would this be formalised in schools? Sorry, what? Would this be f somehow part of the curriculum in schools? It should just absolutely be part of the curriculum, right. how, how, particularly how to cook. As I okay. said, unless you know how to cook, you cannot eat healthily or economically. I would agree with that. I think some people might say that's the job of a parent, though. The parents do not know how to cook either. Right, no. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Just tell it the way it is. That's <laughs> what I think you should do. Tanya, just stop. Yes, please, Tim. I, I do think... Do you know how to cook, Tim? <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, when I'm allowed near the stove, because I supposedly make too much of a mess, um, I do think there is a responsibility on landowners and farmers here um, uh, to actually educate uh, the public who live in our villages uh, and on, on and around our farms. Uh, and we, we, if we're going to make this change, if we're going to get this connection with the consumer, then it is beholden upon us to actually make sure we get ourselves into schools that we open our farms uh, and get groups of school, school children out there, and that we have, as we say in England, open farm Sunday, uh, because only that way will the consumer actually have any hope of working out the fact that milk actually comes from a cow. So farmers actually can, uh, can do something about it with the, without the help of the supermarkets, simply by opening their farms. That would help matters. Good. Ursula. Yes, I would go a step further and say, um, Dealing with food, being able to source food, recognizing good food from bad food, and being able to cook is an elementary life skill, and it will be even more so. So it needs to be implemented in the curricula. And if we, if we look at the money that is spent on um, the health, in, within the health service, on um, the, the, the curing of um, diabetes 2 and, and food-related diseases, um, on a long-term scale, and this is one of the problems <coughs> of our policies and our thinking, we do not think long-term enough, on a long-term scale, it would very much pay off to invest the same amount of money in teacher training, in teacher training um, and implement food education in a, in a, in a holistic sense um, as, as, as part of the curriculum. I mean, we cannot bite off our mobile phone, you know? We need to know how a carrot grows and what to do with it. Any other questions, please? 
Yes, please. Very straight hand over there. We could get a microphone. Please say who you are and where you're from. Thank you. My name is Alain Deletrov from Bioma, which is a smaller organic uh, food company in Switzerland. Well, the, the question to taste has just arrived right now on the table. I think education to taste is one thing, but also legislation is important here. When, you, when you're eating vegetables or fruits that have got 25 treatments of pesticides, mm -hmm. And on the other side, you buy your apple from a farmer where he had only three during the season. I think there is a real difference of food taste here that we could talk about, and also of legislation, because sustainability is also the cost of farming. And in the cost of farming, if I take a region like Brittany in France, or the Beauce, basically you cannot drink 90% of the water wells of Brittany mm -hmm are polluted. There is no industry in Brittany outside the city of Rennes. It's polluted by agriculture. Mm -hmm. And this cost for the global society and nature are, <laughs> of course, not included in the, in the overall problematic of farming. And here it's not only education, it's legislation. And legislation right, so is not doing its work. Right, so uh, I'm just trying to get to the point of what you're trying to say. So you think you would like a bit more legislation? Yes, very clearly. <laughs> Look, we had someone who, do, who is a specialist of bees who just speak over there, right? right. France has, uh, the, the, the Assemblée Nationale has just uh, taken a, a legislation prohibiting certain kinds of pesticides in right. France. It took so long. The bees had been dying for five, six years. That's because we're part of the EU, which brings me now to, <laughs> brings me now to another problem. Tim, who was going to answer that question? Francesco? I mean, I can, yeah, I can just reflect <laughs> on... Taste as being ultimately what counts in food. Uh, I mean, I could come with countless examples of how we try to reformulate chocolate without sugar, totally losing customers. Uh, so yes, again, there's a boundaries that need to be seen, and consumer and the consumer is the king in those cases. And we see uh, we see the impact. This is one on legislation. I agree, again, I, I wouldn't go into specific things, but when it comes to sustainability, sustainability is a big bubble. We shouldn't market and sell sustainability negatives. So in an ideal world, consumers shouldn't have a choice <coughs> on the sustainability negatives. Whatever the negatives are, we can debate, but it shouldn't be right. We shouldn't market those. We shouldn't sell child labor free chocolate. Consumers shouldn't be given a choices on those negative things. Um, now, that's where policy and legislation should come in to provide a level playing field and let us leverage the good stories when they are engaging and they are good. So you're in favour of more legislation too, Tim? Mm. To eliminate the negative. Anybody yes. else like more legislation? Yeah. More? I, I thought that, that Europe is Tim's one of these a bit upset at this point. regions of the world that, that, that where, where food safety is taken extremely seriously. I had, had our representative from DG uh, in, Environment and, uh, or, or, or Sanko, whichever part of the commission he comes from, he, he would have explained exactly what the European legislation is. Uh, it's extremely rigorous. Uh, and, 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 and rightly so, that, 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 uh, that, that ensuring the safety of all food that's on the market uh, is an absolute necessity. Now, of course, there's always an argument about, uh, uh, about the assessment of scientific evidence, and there's now a detailed discussion going on on, on on certain products, but nobody can suggest that this is lightly treated in Europe. Yes, please, there's a question here. <coughs> Is there some giggling at the front? It's not a giggling matter, you know. Yes, uh, yes. Pierre. <laughs> Pierre, Pierre Rage, uh, Are you party to that giggling? No. Pierre Rage, uh, involved in the grain production in uh, France. I must say I'm a little uncomfortable with the conclusions which uh, we are taking tonight uh, in one single way, because the rea reality is much more com complex uh, in my opinion. And my question is for Tim Breitmeier and Alan Bracknell. Don't you think that, in fact, facing this complex, complex situation, we might go in the direction which has been discussed right away, but also in the other direction which might lead to, uh, in parallel, not instead of, in parallel to other solutions, which uh, is... Uh, having a, pr a sustainable production which is competitive at a reasonable price 
uh, and having what a very imp interesting report from the RISE Foundation called uh, uh, sustainable intensification uh, through innovation, because innovation is without any limit, and we can find solutions to so to have both sustainable production and intensific and intensification and competitiveness and reasonable price. Don't you think? Uh, you, we have to, to, to work on both solutions, not, uh, not only one or only the other, of course, but both at the same time. Thank you. Well, I think that's where we're coming to, isn't it, Tim? Thank you, Pierre-Olivier. Uh, you've got me back onto more comfortable territory here. Um, <laughs> yes is the answer. There's no doubt about it that I see that um, the use of technology uh, can significantly help our ability to intensify production without at the same time in any way harming whatsoever uh, the resource protection that we're looking after. And I take an example of, um, uh, of the direct application of fertilizer whilst you are drilling. Um, uh, before we used to put 30 kilograms of fertilizer on the field, now you can actually direct it straight to the root of where the seed is. You can put 17 kilograms on the, on the plant, but actually the plant is receiving 60 kilograms where it needs it. So you're using less fertilizer, you're giving more fertilizer to the plant, you're increasing productivity, and at the same time, you're not using as much resource. So yes, technology has a huge role to play. Uh, I think waste management, which we haven't talked about as well, also has a huge role to play in actually making sure productivity remains, but at a cheap cost and in a biofertilizer form. There we must leave it. Thank you very much to our panelists. We're going to be talking about innovation and uh, solutions next. But first, let me uh, uh, thank you very much and allow you to leave the stage. Thank you very much to Alan, Tim, Francesco, and also Ursula. Thank you.